So we'll start away if we can. Um, my discussion is an overview of the Securities Act. And let me say at the outset that the overview that I intend to give is that of a general practitioner. Obviously, existing in a very large firm, I do some securities law, but let me say at the outset that as compared to my distinguished colleagues here, and you'll see this afternoon, my practice is not restricted by any means to securities. And the reason that I'm giving the introduction is because I want to try and give an overview from the point of view of a general practitioner, and more particularly, how perhaps you can stay out of the requirements of the Securities Act if you, or out of the provisions of the Securities Act dealing with prospectuses if you can. When one looks at the Securities Act, and for those of you that have a book that looks like this, you have to remember, I think, at the outset that the Securities Act is only part of securities legislation in Ontario. This book, for example, has several components to it. It has the Act itself, and there are proposed amendments which are on the way for that Act. It has regulations. It then has a whole series of forms which have been prescribed for use pursuant to the Act. And then there are various policies, which are both policies of various provincial governments who've decided to get together and adopt the same form of standards. And then there are policies which the Ontario Securities Commission in this jurisdiction chooses to apply. And then, of course, we have decisions of the Ontario Securities Commission which are published regularly. And then, of course, there's just practice in terms of knowing how to deal with this Ontario Securities Commission. So altogether, it's important to realize that just reading the Act is sometimes not sufficient. There are three basic requirements contained in securities legislation in Ontario. And those three requirements, I've broken them down in the written paper are first the registration requirement, secondly the prospectus requirement, and third the resale requirement. The basic registration requirement is found in section 24 of the Act. And in what it says is no person or company shall trade, underwrite, or advise on securities unless that person or company is registered. You'll see that the scheme of the Act is to provide quite boldly the prohibition. And there we've seen it. Section 24.1 says you shall not trade, underwrite, or advise on securities unless you're registered. The Act then goes on to provide a variety of exceptions. Having set down the basic rule, it then gives you a variety of exceptions to that rule. And you must fit very strictly into one of those exemptions in order not to be caught by the basic rule. And then if you are still caught, the Act goes on in great detail to explain how you register. The second major requirement is the prospectus requirement. The prospectus requirement is found in section 52 of the Act. And it states that no person or company shall trade in a security unless a preliminary prospectus and a prospectus have been filed. The key word to this concept is that there is a distribution of securities, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But the scheme of the Act, again, is to say there's your prohibition. Section 52 sets out the prohibition. Having set out the prohibition, the Act then contains a variety of exemptions. And if you fit strictly within to one of those exemptions, you do not have to comply with the prospectus requirement. And then third, if you do not fit one of the exemptions, the Act provides for a method of compliance, i.e. a prospectus. While I'm sure most of you are aware of what a prospectus is, a prospectus is merely a public disclosure document, if we can call it that. It is a document which is filed with the Ontario Securities Commission, which is vetted by them very carefully. A great deal of time and effort goes into preparing prospectuses to disclose in a public way all the material information about a particular issuer which is relevant for making a decision on whether or not to invest. We'll come back to that again as well a little later. The third main requirement is the resale requirement. In a way, it's not really to say that it's a requirement, but it's an obvious outgrowth of this Act, the way that it's drafted at present. The current Ontario Securities Act adopts a concept known as the closed system. 
And what it says is this, if you acquire securities pursuant to one of the exemptions from the prospectus requirement, the first time you come to resell that security, the, the act closes around that, secure, that sale and says you can't sell it until you've complied strictly with the act. So the system, the closed system, closes around that and says comply before you can resell. The obvious purpose for that, as we'll see a little later, you can be exempted from the prospectus requirement if you fit clearly within into, one, into one of the prospectus exemptions. Well, having done so, if the system didn't close around a resale, somebody would simply say, oh yes, I bought pursuant to a prospectus exemption here. And right out the back door, the security would go. So in order to prevent that, the closed system has been developed. And that, in a very rough way, is what the closed system does. Those then are the three basic requirements that this act contains. And what I'm going to spend the next little time doing is coming back and looking in more detail at each of those requirements. There's one concept that I think to deal with quickly at the outset as well, and that is, a, is the transition period which was originally set up in the act. This act came into force in 1979, on September 1, and set up a transition period of September 1579 to March 1581, an 18-month transition period. We're now well, now well beyond that, and hence many of the transition provisions we don't have to talk about anymore, but throughout some of the definitions and some of the provisions we're going to talk about, you're going to see this distinction made in terms of dates. And the reason for those dates is merely this 18-month transition period. There are three very important definitions. We're going to, in another discussion, come back to some of them. But let me just highlight the three important definitions that I'll have to hit before we move on. The first is the definition of a security. Suffice at this point for me to say that the definition of security is extremely wide in its coverage. And in section 1140 of the Act, they go through various, a total of 16 various descriptions of what a security is. And I think the very first one says it all when it says any document, instrument, or writing commonly known as a security. So even if you haven't been caught by the other 15, they're sure going to catch you by number one. There'll be a further discussion of that definition coming up this morning, but for our purposes, remember that security is extremely widely defined. The second definition is that of trade, and trade is defined in section 1142. And it is any sale or disposition of a security for valuable, valuable consideration. Again, suffice to highlight that when you read through the definition of trade or trading, the definition is extremely wide and intended to be so. And finally, the definition of an advisor, which is found in the very first subsection of 1.1, any person or company engaging in or holding himself or itself out as engaging in the business of advising others as to the investing or the buying of or selling of securities. If you fall within the definition of an advisor, the regulations up at sections 85 and 86 provide for a method of registration. With those three definitions in mind then of security, trade, and advisor, let's begin with the registration requirement in more detail. The basic requirement, remember, is found in section 24. Having provided for the basic rule, let's just talk about one other concept which is contained in section 24, and that is the definition of an underwriter. An underwriter basically is someone who purchases securities by contract and who assumes the risk for the resale of those securities on to somebody else. The Wood Gundys, McLeod Young Weir, Dominion Securities, Pitfield, those people in the world generally constitute underwriters. 
they for their own account, if you like, purchase the securities with an intention of selling them on to other people. But the definition, when you read it as well, could catch a lot more than what are traditionally regarded as those large investment houses. So when you're reading section 24, the prohibition also applies if you somehow become caught by the definition of underwriting. So the basic scheme of section 24 is to provide you shall not do these things unless you register. Having set out the prohibition, we then move up to sections 33 and 34 to find our, our way out. Section 33 says certain advisors do not need to be registered. And there's a list of the types of persons and corporations that do not need to be registered as advisors. You'll notice that you and I constitute one of them, a lawyer, an accountant, engineer, teacher. There's a variety of groups not required to register. But I would draw to your attention the closing words of section 33, where the performance of the service as an advisor is solely and I pause on that word for a moment, incidental to their principal business or occupation. So when advising people as to whether or not they can get out of the registration requirement because they fall within one of those groups, beware of the final concluding words of that section in terms of an incidental performance of that, of that duty. Section 34, sub 1, then goes on to exempt certain kinds of trades. And 34, sub 1, exempts 23 specific kinds of trades. And then section 34, sub 2, goes on to exempt certain types of securities. And there are 15 types of securities exempted. At the risk of overkill, let's just go back and see what they've simply done then. They've said in section 24, the prohibition is established. Then we move up to section 33, and we exempt from that basic prohibition advisors. We then in 34.1 exempt trades of certain kinds, and in 34.2 securities of certain kinds. So very simply, your job to find an, a way out of the registration requirement is to find yourself as an advisor, to hopefully fit yourself into one of the 23 kinds of trades exempted, or one of the 15 kinds of securities exempted. If you've done that, you can then move on to the next square and not have to obviously worry about registration at all. Let's look for a second at some of those exempt trades which are found in 34 sub 1. There will be a paper on the exemptions a little later. But I want to pause here, if I may, just to, to give a flavor for some of the kinds of trades and some of the kinds of securities which are being exempted. In terms of exempt trades, first off, notice the first one, which is in 34 sub 1, 1. A trade by an executor, an administrator, guardian, committee or by an authorized trustee. So in a day-to-day -day practice where an executor passes on securities, registration by that executor is not required. You've got a specific exemption in 34.1. In three, for example, a trade where the party purchasing as principal is a bank, well, the act is saying if you're a bank on that side of the trade, you do not need to be registered. I think there's a theoretical obvious reason for that, and that is that those parties do not necessarily, in terms of the public's eyes, need to be registered in the sense that the Ontario Securities Commission or some regulatory authority needs to vet their competence. We could question many of these in here if we wanted to, but that's the statutory framework that's been established, is that the purpose behind these is the public, if you want to call it that, does not necessarily need protection from the kinds of parties 
affecting this trade. The various trades which are exempted in section 34 sub 1 and thus get you out of the registration requirement are going to be very similar to the ones we're going to see in a few moments under the prospectus exemptions in 71.1. I say again, there'll be a discussion of each of, the, or of a lot of these in a few moments, but let's move on now to 34.2, which says there are various kinds of securities which are exempted. The biggie right off the top is debt instruments, bonds, debentures, or other evidences of, debt, of indebtedness offer guaranteed by the government of Canada. Well, the theory of exempting government securities is that this is not the type of issuer from whom we need protection. Banks, the theory of it is, is that you, the investing public, do not necessarily need to be protected when you buy securities of some banks. I make the same comment there, I suppose. Again, the statutory framework is set up. Perhaps many of us would like a little more disclosure about the state of Her Majesty's government or about the state of some of our friendly banks. But the theory of this is, is that there are certain types of securities when issued by certain entities from which you and I don't need protection. Canada savings bonds fit within this exemption. There's one that draws a great deal of attention when we start to think a little more about it, and that is the one found in paragraph 10, which is securities of a private company where they are not offered for sale to the public. This is unfortunately a trap if you're not wary. What this section is saying is that if you've got a private company and you want to issue securities, you don't need a prospectus, provided that those securities are not offered to the public. And the trap is this. Many lawyers, when they're looking at whether or not they're caught by the registration requirement and the prospectus requirement, focus in and say, oh, I've got a private company, close the book. And that's just not right. And the reason is those last words, where they are not offered for sale to the public. One of the major advances that this act made when it came in in, in 1979 was to abolish the concept of the public. What the act said in the old days is that you only got into this act if you made a distribution to the public of securities. And the theory behind legislation was to say, we're no longer going to have the concept of the public. If you've got a distribution, you comply with this act. You find a way out. But they've left these words to the public in that paragraph 10. And I go on for about two pages, I think, in the written materials. And I'll leave it to you to read. But what I'm doing is focusing on it's not that simple. The question of who is the public is very relevant to sell securities to your brother or your sister or your mother or your uncle or your aunt or a business colleague may not be the public and hence you could get your exemption. But beware that a friend, a colleague at, at another club or at the cottage or something else may very well constitute the public. And there are cases periodically where the Ontario Securities Commission has brought forth a prosecution or where the courts have upheld it, saying there's no way that that person to whom you sold securities was not the public. And as a result, you could not rely on this exemption. So I draw it to your attention and be careful with it. There is also an, an excellent paper prepared on the subject in the 1980 Canadian Bar Association uh, conference that was held in May of that year on securities law question of the public is still relevant. That's the registration requirement. You register under 24 or you find your exemption under section 33, 34 1 or 34 2. If you found your exemption, we move on now to the prospectus requirement. If you haven't found your exemption, you comply. 
for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to move on because usually you find an exemption. And, and again, from, from my point of view in, in terms of, of a general practice, I want to get myself out of the registration requirement because I don't want to have to register. If I have to register, I'm going to find someone down the hall that knows more about what to do than I do about this. The second major requirement then is the prospectus requirement. Recall the basic rule is set out in section 52. You cannot trade in a security unless you file a prospectus. Section 52, in its wording, adopts the concept of before 15 March 1981 and after 15 March 1981. Again, that's that transition period we spoke of earlier. The result is where we are today, obviously, is that any trade which fits within Section 52 requires that a prospectus be filed. So just like the Section 24 requirement, we get the bold statement, thou shalt file a prospectus. Having done that, we're then interested in finding some exemptions. But before going on, we've picked up a concept here of a distribution. And there is a definition of a distribution contained in section 1111 of the Act. <coughs> there are basically six rules as to when you've got a distribution. First, if you're issuing securities for the first time, that is a distribution. If you're reselling some of your own securities, that's a distribution. If somebody is selling a control block, which is generally 20% of the holding of, a, of the voting shares of a particular corporation, simplify. If you sell a control block, that is a distribution. If you're an underwriter and you sell your securities, that is distribution. If you do any of those things, you've got a distribution of securities and Section 52 comes into play. We want to get out of that because we don't want to file a prospectus. It's a long process. It's an expensive process. So now what we do is we say, I've read the rule. We now flip up and see if we can't find some exemptions. <coughs> Excuse me. There are three broad areas where you're going to find exemptions. The symmetry of this act is there. Just as we found three major areas of exemptions for registration requirement, so too do we with the prospectus requirement. First, 71.1 contains 19 specific exemptions. Then section 72 by reference, picks up all of the securities types exemptions that we found in section 34 sub 2. And then finally, if you can't find an exemption under one of those two areas, it's always open to you to go to the Ontario Securities Commission under section 73, go to the Securities Commission and ask for what is called a section 73 order. And that is explain why, even though you haven't found a specific exemption, the public good would be served by them ordering that you don't need a prospectus. That is difficult, but not impossible. So there we have it. Under section 52, you must file a prospectus. We then find our specific exemptions under section 71.1 under section 72, or get an order under section 73. Let's look at some of the exemptions. The first one is in section 71.1. Where the purchaser is a bank, or Her Majesty in Right of Canada or Province, any municipal corporation, where that entity purchases as principal, a prospectus is not required. Again, the theory of these exemptions you're going to see is that there is a sophistication of knowledge 
that these people don't need the protection of a prospectus. D, the purchaser purchases as principal if the trade has a value of not less than $97,000. The theory is that anybody who can afford to spend $97,000 on, on an investment does not necessarily need the protection of a prospectus. So each one of these, as you go through them, has a policy behind it, has a goal behind it, but you're looking at various entities, philosophically, that the statute has taken the view do not need the protection of a prospectus, and hence you can buy without one. So look for yourself in there. The biggies are what's called the private placement exemption, which is that, that one of, of $97,000. There'll be further discussions of those later on today as well. Focus on two others just quickly, 71-1N, a trade made by an issuer in securities of its own issue with its employees. So you can, under certain circumstances, sell securities to employees and avoid the prospectus requirement. A biggie as well is 71-1P, which is called the seed capital exemption. We'll talk about that later on today as well, but basically what it says is you may make an offer to not more than 50 people, of whom not more than 25 take up your offer, provided you do some very strict compliance with this act. And that is one that we see over and over and over again, and I'm sure the OSC does as well, as being botched, because the requirements are very strict, and it's not as easy as all that. So be careful with 711P. There'll be a discussion of that later on. Then what we've got in section 72, it says that sections 52 and 61 do not apply to a distribution of securities referred to in subsection 34.2, accepting 14 and 15 of that list. So what we're doing here is picking up all those exempt securities that are referred to in 34.2. Rather than just reproduce the list by reference, they've taken you back to 34.2. And then your final solution is to go to the Ontario Securities Commission and ask them for an order under Section 73. So the statutory framework for both registrations and prospectuses is substantially the same. The requirement for registration is set out in section 24, and then we then exempt three, three major areas. Advisors under 33, trades under 34.1, and securities under 34.2. We then set forth the prospectus requirement in section 52, and again, three major areas of exemption. It's those that are described in section 71.1, the securities that are picked up under Section 72, referring back to 34.2, or go to the OSC under Section 73. Short and sweet, those are the two major requirements. We now move to the closed system, and we're going to talk about the resale requirement. If you manage to find an exemption in one of those prospectus requirements, we, from, one of the prospect, from the prospectus requirement that we looked at, and therefore you've been able to cause a distribution to take place free of the prospectus requirement, as I said earlier, these securities can only be resold if you comply strictly with the resale provisions of this Act. Again, basically what the Act is, does is closes in around the resale of that security. And those resale provisions are found in section, subsection 71, 4, 5, and 6. And what they've done from an organizational point of view, and the way that, that it's structured is to say, here are the resale requirements set forth in section 71, 4, 
and they apply to these prospectus exemptions. And then there's resale provisions under 71 sub 5, and they apply to these prospectus exemptions. And then you've got 71 sub 6, which says, well, if we didn't pick you up under some of those, we're going to pick you up here. So each of the prospectus exemptions, you look for where your resale requirement is. In some cases, there is none, but in almost all of them, there is. The result is the only way you can sell your securities out of this closed system are three ways. First, you find yourself another Section 71.1 exemption or 72 exemption, i.e., another prospectus exemption. If you could have sold it the first time free of a prospectus, you can sell it the second time. Second, you obtain a Section 73 order from the Ontario Securities Commission. And if those two don't work, you're into the third one, comply with the statute. Let's take an example. If you purchase pursuant to a prospectus exemption that is governed by Section 7114, There are two requirements that you must fulfill, or that must be fulfilled, in order for you to be entitled to sell out of the closed system. First, the issuer must be a reporting issuer. For ease of reference and oversimplified, a reporting issuer is someone who's issued a prospectus. Secondly, that reporting issuer must not be in default. The Securities Act contains reporting requirements that require reporting issuers to keep themselves up to date. And I detail those under what's referred to as the continuous disclosure provisions of the Act. And I talk about those requirements in the paper. But the theory behind it is, <clears throat> is that the public is going to have information about certain reporting issuers, which is available to anybody, anytime. So if we're governed by Section 71.4, we look at what it says in terms of strict compliance. For example, if you bought under 71.1D, you bought securities which had a value in excess of $97,000. You come along to resell them. Well, you can't find another prospectus exemption. You don't want to go to the Ontario Securities Commission. You're straightforwardly into 71.4. And what it says to you is you comply with the issuer, but the issuer must be reporting issuer. He must not be in default. And it sets up a system of statutory hold periods. It says that in order for those securities to be resold, you must have held them for a certain minimum period. Now, what it's doing is setting forth in 71.4, in paragraphs A, B, A and B, sorry, various periods depending on the type of security that you've got. In simplified terms, if the security is listed on a recognized stock exchange or it's legal for life, it must have been held for at least six months. If it's listed only, 12 months. And if it's neither of the above, 18 months. Legal for life, very simply, is a security which is legal for a life insurance company to buy, if you want to phrase it that way. The governing statutes for insurance companies, trust companies, pension funds, etc., all provide that these entities, whose funds are held for the benefit of others usually, can make only certain kinds of conservative investments, and they prescribe what they are. If the security you're selling fits within the type of security they can buy, it's quote unquote legal for life. So what 7114 is saying is if you've got a listed security and it's legal for life, you can sell that having only had it for six months. Listed only 12 months, all others 18 months. Unfortunately, most of us are going to fit into the 18 months requirement. 
you've got a problem, I'm afraid, if you can't find another exemption, and because of a variety of reasons, you cannot comply with Section 7114. I keep putting an extra one in there, there shouldn't be. Section 71 sub 5 contains similar requirements, but they have not placed the statutory hold periods, but again, the concepts are substantially the same. Information is available on the public file. Information about that particular issuer is available for all to see, and accordingly, it should be quote unquote safe to have that security resold. The key factor on these resale requirements, which will be talked about later again, is that the closed system may result in you being unable to sell that security and beware of it. Continuous disclosure is a subject that doesn't require a lot of attention here now, but just in an overview of the Act, it's important that we take note of the fact that it exists. And in the written materials, I have indicated the various requirements, such as material changes, financial statements, that must go to the Ontario Securities Commission in order for the public file to be up to date. Because obviously, if the closed system is going to work and say, fine, you can sell a security out provided that reporting issuer is up to date in his filings and that sort of thing. Well, the system isn't going to work if there isn't then a requirement for this continuous disclosure to be made to the OSC. So there are <clears throat> excuse me, clear provisions on the types of things that have to go to the OSC. And in the written materials, I've attempted to summarize those as best I can. I think the final major area to take note of that exists in the statute is the insider trading and self-dealing provisions. Under this area, there are really two concepts. Insider trading, insiders who trade must report those trades to the regulatory authority. And secondly, certain persons who are in a position of trust owe a duty to others and hence may not make use of certain confidential information. The Ontario Business Corporations Act provides only for the latter. In other words, it provides only for the concept of using inside information for your own benefit. The Securities Act picks up the same provision using the, relation, the special relationship concept and says that if you are in a special relationship with others, you may not use that information to your own benefit. And talks about, because we're now dealing as well with public corporations, insider trading reports, which must, with, which must be filed with the OSC. So OBCA deals only with the liability provision, <clears throat> whereas the Securities Act deals with both. What I've attempted to do in the written paper is summarize the provisions of each and to some extent try and distinguish. The words are slightly different, but the concepts are substantially the same between the OBCA and the Securities Act. Suffice at this point to say that beware that people who are in that position, largely arising out of the corporate opportunity doctrine, I suppose, and being in a special relationship, owe duties to others and will be liable for the misuse of that information for their own benefit. That's the end of my comments in terms of an overview of the Act. What we're going to do for the balance of the day is pick away at various parts of this and come in and focus on some of them in more detail. What I think we might do is proceed right on to our next talk, if we may. We'll then take questions, perhaps, at the end of that. <clears throat>
Our next speaker is Grant Heenan, who is a partner here in Toronto at the firm of Campbell, Godfrey, and Lutus. Grant has participated, as a number of our speakers will you'll find today, in what's turned out to be a very valuable experience that goes on between the Ontario Securities Commission and members of the profession, both for lawyers and accountants, is an exchange program. And uh, Grant was at the Ontario Securities Commission participating in that, and obviously practices heavily in the area of securities at Campbell Godfrey. Grant is going to focus a little more detailed on some of the provisions <clears throat> dealing with securities. Grant, I'll let you have this wonderful microphone. 